Hello. Hey. Hi, everybody. My name is John McInerney. I'm the interim director of the ICA. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to say a few, few words. Thank you. Um, and then we're going to bring up the curators and the artists. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, I just want to mention uh, Amy Sedow, my good friend and peer, and the former director, stepped down over the summer. She's working on several new projects, including a book that will focus on the ways art, politics, and community intersect. On behalf of everyone here at the ICA, we wish her the best in her new adventures. Um, I will be very brief. The focus right now should be on these um, incredible shows and the artist curators and the people that put them together. I do want to say how honored I am to be asked by the provost to serve in this role, and I want to also acknowledge my boss and mentor, Vice Provost Anita Allen. This is actually my second tour at ICA. I worked in the early aughts at the ICA under Claudia Gould, and it was one of the most incredible experiences in my life. The artists that ICA exhibits and champions are two of one, some of the most important creative voices working in the arts today. I had the privilege of working on several exhibitions that gave important exposure to emerging artists at that time, including Charles Ledre and Lisa Yaskavage, and also local artists with international re renown who have become dear friends, including Virgil Marty and Sarah McEnany. It's exciting to be back at ICA and have an opportunity to work with so many inspiring artists again. The other benefit of serving as the interim director is working with the amazing staff. It's been so impressive to see how hard everyone has worked over the last few weeks getting these shows ready and, and um, preparing these important, beautiful, and carefully considered exhibitions. You will meet some of them tonight, but I do want to acknowledge them because they truly make all of this possible. In the curatorial department, Anthony Elms, Robert Cheney, Meg Only, hold your applause, <laughs> as a lot, um, Alex Klein, Daniela Rose King, Kate Abercrombie, and Caitlin Palmer. In development, Bruno Nuril, Christina Yu, Michelle Pearson, and Taja Jones. In marketing, Jill Katz and Ali Abdel Mosen. In public engagement, James Britt, Natalie Sandstrom, Elizabeth Chong, Derek Rigby, and Tusif Noor. In finance, Shannon Friedis and Jess Kamensky, and in the director's office, Lauren Downey. Lastly, the incredible preparator crew, led by Paul Swinbeck. I want to acknowledge them briefly as well. Kat, Jacinta, uh, Hannah, Emily, Joy, David, Adam, Patrick, Drew, Julia, Jay, Ash, George, Fred, Will, Jake, Jacob, Jeremy, and Sophie. Let's give them all a big hand. <laughs> and of course, all of this couldn't, would not be possible without the support of our funders, including our board of overseers. And I also want to acknowledge the critical support of the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, the Sachs Contemporary Arts Fund, the Sachs Program for Arts Innovation, I think I've heard of that, and <laughs> Dolfinger McMahon Foundation. Um, and I'm sorry, also in the Daniel Dietrich Foundation. Um, for Arms, Ache, Avid, Aeon, I want to acknowledge the artists, Nancy Brooks Brody, Joy uh, 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 Episala, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get it, uh, Zoe Leonard and uh, Carrie Yamaoka, and the organizers at the Beeler Gallery at the Columbus College of Art and Design, Joey Tang, Ian Rafino, and Maria Roddy, and of course our chief curator, Anthony Elms. For Michelle Lopez, Ballast and Barricades, I wanna of course thank Michelle Lopez and also her artist assistants, Rebecca Nagel, Willie Udell, Andy Clifford, Adam Franklin, and TD. Um, also Michelle's Gallery, Simon Preston, New York, Adelphia Demolition Company, you'll see why I'm mentioning them. Um, the Annenberg Center and its scene shop where much of the show was created. And finally, the Stuart Weitzman School of Design where Michelle is a faculty member. And then finally, our own Alex Klein who curated the exhibition. And then I wanna acknowledge Meg Only, the curator of Colored People Time, a three-part series of exhibitions which concludes with this installation, The Banal Present, featuring Carolyn Lazard, Cameron Rowland and Sable Elise Smith. Also their galleries, uh, Jasmine Sue and Marie Catalano at JTT and Maxwell Graham and Eli Copeland at Essex Street. And also wanna thank the lender of Sable's work, uh, Cal Siegel. 
Most importantly, thank you for your presence and support and for all you do to support artists, contemporary expression, and the ICA. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Anthony Elms. Uh, good evening, and I would like to thank Joey, um, who if I'm sitting here on stage, it's actually because of Joey, um, so I have a lot to thank for him. And um, sadly for you all, we are the only ones that are gonna be on stage, but the four artists are with us tonight and very friendly, and so um, I no encourage you. No uh, yeah, uh, mostly friendly, but you know, really, they would love to talk to you, so like, don't feel shy about reaching out to them anytime during the evening. Um, but yes, this is a group exhibition on the first floor, and it comes from the Beeler. Technically, this is chapter five of a, well, now a five chapter exhibition. The first four chapters happened over a year at the Beeler. And so I wonder if I could ask Joey, who is really that person that sort of started a lot of these conversations going, if you could say a word or two about where this came from, why these four artists, why we're here. Yeah, hi, thank you everybody for coming. I just wanna quickly thank everybody, um, echoing all the, the acknowledgements of everyone, the um, preparators crew, um, Anthony, um, also the registrar Kate um, Abercrombie and uh, Paul Swinback and Robert Cheney. Um, um, this project started in 2015 actually um, and I approached the artist to work on a project specifically not an exhibition. Um, and um, that was a little bit a way to get them to say yes, I guess. Um, but also really thinking about what artists need at this moment in time. Um, that exhibition might not be the only route of, uh, of public engagement and uh, life work that the artists might want to engage in. So um, slowly um, I began to work with uh, some of them uh, on other projects as a way to learn about how to work with each other and what does it mean to work with each other. Um, so when I had the chance to go to, to move to Columbus, I suggested uh, let's take it into uh, the gallery and um, bring this into an exhi exhibition format. Um, and really to keep it not, not as a static exhibition, uh, at Beeler we had four different chapters and some artworks would uh, shift from one to another chapter, some artworks would leave temporarily and come back. So really to, to think of the present as a really important way to engage. Um, so I'll show you some of the other chapters, but I also wanna say that um, most people have not seen those four chapters and the present is the most kind of important moment for us. <clears throat> okay, and so maybe we can just step back and say that we do have four artists who happen to have a shared history as part of a collective named Fierce Pussy, but what you will not see in the exhibition is necessarily a historical show that ties only to this organization or to this group. We really have a representation, yes, of that organization, and it's such, or collective, whatever we want to call it, and it's various endeavors over the years, but we also have, outside of that, a showing of a group exhibition that really is about four people and the sort of collective knowledge, affinities, and care for each other's practices and works um, that unfolds that's not really about a historical time, that is really about them thinking through their work and what they know of each other and each other's work here and now. Y yeah, so if, um, let's... And so this would be an example of what you will see when you go into the archival work, seeing some of the works and some of the placards. And maybe you wanna say a bit about Fierce Pussy? Yeah, first? Fierce Pussy was formed in 1991 um, when the artists were very much engaged with um, the onset of the AIDS crisis, which is still ongoing. Um, and they were involved with a group called ACT UP, uh, which stands for uh, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And they put out a call um, to, um, to give a kind of visibility to, to other women and lesbians who are very involved in fighting against uh, the AIDS crisis. Um, so you will see later on in the archive room some of the early works that they made together in the first meeting. Um, this is one of the, the list posters that they've made. Um, it uh, attempts to reclaim derogatory terms thrown at queer folks, um, some of 
us might have experienced. Um, and important to know that um, they would do a lot of remixes. So this list constantly is being updated uh, through time since 1991. So you see different versions of that addressing a kind of um, uh, in on these two. It, the list ends with and proud, and to recent years, uh, it sort of extends uh, outwards. Um, it will end with the with the words and so are you. So thinking about the individual and the collective, and how. Um, those parameters are constantly shifting in time. Yeah, and so I'll just settle. What you'll see now is like there are some images of where the show has come and in some of its various chapters. And so these are some install shots just so people have a sense of some of what's happened in the near past and some of what to experience when you'll go into our gallery and see how they've decided to re sort of look at each other and recombine each other for this moment. Yes, yeah, so what you see here um, is actually chapter one. Um, on the left, you have a room uh, of works by Joya Pisala, and on the right, a room by um, Nancy Brooks Brody. So we, we began the project with the individual um, artists having their own room. Um, on the left, you have um, Zoe Leonard, um, and on the right, I believe that's chapter th three. Chapter three, uh, where you see all four artists' works in one place. So it's this slow movement of the individual merging into a collective um, space. Um, on the left, you have chapter two. Uh, on, the, on the walls, you have Zoe Leonard on the left, Joya Pisala on the right, and the, these shoes, which are also on view here at ICA uh, of Nancy Brooks Brody. Uh, more example on the right. So here you can see how the shoes move from one room to another, uh, but they're actually a different pair of shoes um, of a series by um, Nancy Brooks Brody. So the memory of the experience uh, and the experience of the works uh, become a kind of uh, a way to navigate uh, through time. I had, there was one art historian who said that he, um, they really thought they learned how to uh, grow with art. Um, I quite like that um, way of thinking about exhibition. Um, on the right, you have a work by um, Kerry Yamaoka. It's a Costil de Spook number two. It's a series of work um, where she had rephotographed um, books that had been banned uh, coming into the country. Uh, but through a process of reduction, uh, reduction and erasure that still um, holds a kind of presence. Um, in this work, yeah, that this was in chapter four. And these are short introductions, so that's all the time we have now, but if you would like to interrogate us personally or amongst the artists or alongside the artists, uh, we will have a conversation in November 16th, and it's not just us two, and it's not just the artist, but also art historian Jill Kassid and Jenning Tang will be joining for people that are very familiar with the artists individually and collectively. And then sooner than that, I'll be giving a tour through the galleries, thinking through some of the works and thinking through some of the ways that it behaves here in our space. And maybe I add one thing that Joe Cassid uh, had experienced all, all four chapters of, at, in Columbus and Jeanine Tang had not seen any of the chapters. So really providing a different kind of perspective, uh, thinking about a different kind of uh, way of thinking through ICA, and um, yeah, that, that will, please come. Thank you so much. All right, um, it's so nice to see you all. Thank you for coming. Um, and if I forget to kind of say my thanks at the end, I just want to give another round of thanks to our entire team here at ICA who really, really kind of just hit it out of the ballpark on this one. And you'll see what I mean when you go upstairs. Um, we had a lot of late nights, and it's really been worth it. Um, but thank you again to the crew and Paul and um, you know everyone, Kate included. Um, so. Just to kind of begin, Michelle is an artist that I've kind of been following on and off for about 20 years. 
Um, <laughs> and so I was especially you know, happy to know that she was gonna be joining our community here in Philadelphia. And I basically pounced on her when she arrived. <laughs> um, and we started a conversation. Um, and through that dialogue, I learned that Michelle was uh, really eager to try to st uh, try something on a larger scale. She'd worked architecturally before, um, but we wanted to kind of expand some of the things that you'd been thinking about uh, in another non-commercial context. Uh, and it seemed like the perfect fit for something we might be able to support at ICA. So that's where the dialogue began. So um, I'm just absolutely thrilled to have her a part of Penn community um, as someone who I'd been kind of looking at over the years. So here we go, if I can find the clicker. Um, so some of you might know Michelle's work uh, as someone who is really uh, quite, what? Okay. okay. Uh, I often think of your work as, as kind of uh, exploring materials in kind of unconventional ways. Se you, do, you seem to have this way of performing a kind of acrobat acrobatics with the everyday. But another kind of thematic is a kind of, um, I think a feminist approach to histories of uh, minimalist sculpture and, and histories of sculpture in general that have often been predominantly male driven. Um, and thinking through kind of pop icons through the similar kind of lens. And I wanted to kind of begin through that kind of fusion of material and a kind of politic with your uh, Blue Angel paper series because I think it's a nice way to kind of start as a way to think through some of the themes in the show. Um, and just here up on the screen I have, a, for reference, just kind of an icon like a John McCracken, and you can see one of her paper angels in the middle that's in her show. So anything with a yellow and uh, white stripe is something that's actually upstairs. Um, and then uh, an architectural kind of scaled uh, version of the piece. So, um, so this work actually came, you know, I had been working, thinking a lot about sculpture and objects, and this work actually came out of less, I mean, in combination with working as a sculptor, but also in relationship to the experience of 9-11 and having a show down in Soho when, you know, I think um, it's interesting that, that this opening is September 13th because, um, the show was also opening September 13th, 2011. No, 2001, sorry. And, um, and after that, everything changed in terms of how I thought about sculpture and how I thought about myself as um, an artist, working also as a woman, and, um, and, and thinking more about this kind of abject debris um, and so when I was making these pieces, I was thinking more about this hybrid question of how could I make these feathered, crashing, collapsing debris structures that could be sculpture. And so it kind of evolved into this question about minimalism. So these are pieces that are really just, um, and also I was just thinking about how I didn't want, I had been before making these kind of finished fetish objects in the very much same way as like John McCracken and had decided like, I, like do I even want to make anything anymore? And um, so Paper Angels, well this, these are actually called Blue Angels, which is, um, you know, it derives from the acrobatic stunt um, flying pilots who do all these stunts and, um, so it was, um, yeah, just having them still be um, these things and used out of industrial materials, but having it have a kind of fragility and a kind of brokenness to it, and also just having it be more in relationship to drawing, which I think is an important element in my work, that there's this one-to-one -to, -one to it where it's all just crushed with me just kind of wrestling with it and then putting it up and mm. I mean a lot of these are actually I throw a lot of these away because um, yeah if I overwork them then yeah just mm -hmm. kind of 
But I think this yeah. is an important point. I mean, um, Michelle, you are often bo engaging bodily with your materials. So there's a lot of things you're going to see in the show that look like they're fabricated but are actually made by hand or things that have been found that have been modified to do impossible things. So keep your eyes out for that in the show. Um, another thing that it brings to mind, though, is this kind of question of uh, there's a wonderful quote from Michelle where she talks about um, kind of the uh, kind of an absence of figuration and how there's a violence that's present uh, in our structures. And I think that is speaking both to um, kind of the structures of society as much as it is the built environment. So um, the entrance to the exhibition is a, two, is a piece from 2011. So you're going to see a few older p works that kind of speak to the larger installation that Michelle made for ICA. Uh, this is a piece called Halyard. Uh, it could look like a piece of architecture in the space. It might be a minimalist sculpture, but it also is actually a flagpole with a flag that is missing. So you're going to hear the kind of violent waving of a flag. So of course that stands in for this kind of specter of a violent nationalism. This was made in 2011. Oh, but 2014, oh, actually, I think. 2014, sorry. 2014, but of course in 2019 it takes on another kind of resonance. Um, and just very quickly, because I know we're, we're kind of short on time, the, the body of work that really leads into where uh, we went upstairs is a body of work called House of Cards that's really ba uh, premised on this idea of balance and counterbalance. And of course, the House of Cards has uh, a material connotation, but also could stand in for a kind of political system. Um, and so I just want you to look at these kind of delicate lines and pieces of rubble uh, as a kind of uh, almost like a sketch in a way for the larger installation upstairs. Um, and just thinking through some of the material forms that um, are going to be present in the show that are as much about kind of building up and blocking. So um, Michelle, as a kind of segue then, do we want to talk? And so these are the Hong Kong protests down there, a st uh, photograph taken on the streets in Philadelphia of the kind of rampant gentrification and crumbling infrastructure, quite literally, but then also the kind of the buttressing. So there's a kind of duality between kind of hope and action and violence um, against bodies by in these in these spaces. So I'm going to conclude with this, and then maybe Michelle can say a few words about this kind of undergirding idea. Um, so when we started, there was this drawing. And I don't want to show you a picture of the installation because I want you to uh, experience it for yourselves in the round. But would you like to say a few words? Um, so, so I wanted to, so the premise of the installation is that I wanted to create this uh, fragment of a building, have it counterbalance this collapsing scaffolding system. Um, and so these are drawings of um, <clears throat> that come um, that come out of this show called House of Cards, where um, I was making these kind of like in the same way that I was thinking about paper angels in terms of these very industrial materials. I wanted there to be this kind of just fragile scaffolding system that was being supported by these ropes. So the ro so everything is moving in reverse. The ropes are just, um, they're, they become these structural things where they're embedded with rods and we fabricated a lot of the ropes ourselves so that they could actually support a scaffolding system. So, um, so yeah, so, I don't know what else to say about it. It's just, a, it's, there's, I don't know, you can. Well, I think just this, the title, Ballast and Barricades, you'll see the ballast when you get upstairs. It is a literal fragment from a building that has been lopped off the side of a, of a building up in the Northeast. Um, and there are barricades everywhere. I mean, House of Cards really came from literally just dealing with this instability of, um, having this new administration and just feeling this um, g wanting to create these these structures that were on the brinks of brink of collapse mm -hmm. so a lot of it was from just having these architectural structures that were both weighting things down and mm -hmm. and then just also these weird other things just pushing it up exactly. so that's a part of it so 
there's metaphors everywhere, but also impossible material explorations. Um, and you'll notice there were there are hard hats in the in the install. Um, so please come back for some of the programs uh, of note. I just want to call out the one on October 16th um, that Michelle has co-organized with some artists she's in dialogue with, Josh Klein and Paul Pfeiffer, and the curator um, Joselina Cruz, and they're going to be talking specifically about. Philippinex identity and relationship to race in the museum and the rise of authoritarianism in the US and the Philippines. So thank you. Greetings. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? There's so many people in here. Can you guys open the doors just back there? I can see other people, including David Hart, who I want to thank. Um, I'm Meg Only. Um, I'm the assistant curator here at the ICA, and I'm joined by Carolyn Lazard. I just have to confirm, Sable Lee Smith, are you in the audience? Cameron Rollin, are you in the audience? Nay, all right. So both of those artists are in this show, but they're running late, so they can't join us. But I just want to say a few things really quick before we get into this conversation. Um, over the past year, I've been curating this exhibition called Colored People Time. Um, it's existed in the same space, and it has sort of um, occupied, um, but also really particularly thought through the conditions of temporality um, here um, at the ICA, but also kind of broader and thinking through kind of constructions of blackness as a really quick summaration of like an entire year project. And I just want to say just a huge thank you to Amy Sadow. I remember once talking to Amy and Amy to a donor. If you know Amy, she looked at me and looked at the donor and she's like, her ovaries are like steel. <laughs> and I remember feeling kind of awkward in the way that you can sometimes around Amy but in a, another Sagittarius way, got what she was saying. And I just really cannot give enough thanks to her and Anthony Elms for green lighting a show called Color People Time for the course of a year. Um, I really recognize that a lot of exhibitions and a lot of museums wouldn't do that. And I'm deeply proud uh, to be here at the ICA and just a huge nod to her. I also really want to thank Amber Rose Johnson, my homie who has been through this entire project, who answered your phone calls at God knows what time in the morning to talk through projects <laughs> and thinking through this piece. And I'm writing the catalog right now and I just had this kind of uh, memory of when I first started thinking through this, of walking down to Federal Donuts, and I ran into David Hart, and I was like, I'm so torn about this show, and he said, your exhibitions don't have to be for everyone, and I think this exhibition is not for everyone, it is so much for us, and it's a show that we've created here, and so I just want to say thank you, David, thank you to all the black people that have shown up consistently, Doreen, I see you back there, um, <laughs> shout out, so anyways. <laughs> I'm gonna read something, Carolyn's gonna talk, and then we're gonna call it a day. So, as I was thinking through this show, it's really easy to talk about blackness in the future, it's really easy to talk about blackness in the past, but I was really struggling when considering what it meant in the present moment. Oftentimes when you're thinking about the present, it's often through a more um, interior self, a meditative practice, and I've had the benefit of being in conversation with just amazing, typically black women through this process. Sidia Hartman was one of the first people I talked to. Tina Camp, I've worked with her text. And at this point, come around June, I was really desperate and asking all the curators, what should I be reading? I don't know what the show's gonna be. I thought the show was gonna use time as a material, but like, Jesus Christ, like I'm really far behind. And so I kind of hail married it, and I leaned on intergenerational black female help. And I called up Nurbese Philip, the author of Zong, and I said, can you help me with this show? And Nurbese met with me. Amber Rose and I drove to Toronto with my dog, and I talked to her for three hours, and that conversation will be in the catalog. But I wanted to read to you guys something I've been kind of reading in relationship to this show. You'll see part of it in it. And it's an addendum that Nurbese wrote me the day after our meeting. It was uh, from June 25th. And she says, Dear Meg, as expected, I had many, many thoughts after our conversation. Things I should have said, for instance, that time, or rather modulated or curated time into past, present, and future is a construct that we need to negotiate in the daily, the quotidian, that physics posits that all time is now, 
that the present is deeply ensconced in the past and that most phenomena that we experience as the present are already the past. For example, sunlight takes eight minutes to reach us, starlight or our thoughts. That now is present, is past, is future. The past is now, as is the future, and all we have is meaning. Our fear of flight from or embrace of it in its fragile and fractally fragmented multiplicity. Yours, Nurbese. I told her I couldn't respond to the email because I was just like, <laughs> how do you respond to that? But it is the text I've been carrying around in my pocket this entire time. I've been thinking about the now in relationship to these three artists' works. And Carolyn, you're like one of my like closest brain trust people. You're the person that proposed Color People Time to begin with. And tonight we're unveiling a new commission of your work, um, which is really moving and I know it's so fresh for you to be in it, but multiple people have cried already, including myself. And so it is a really touching and powerful piece. And will you talk a little bit about the history, what it means to be here as well? Sure. Um, I just want to say one quick thing, which is that Meg told me that this thing started at 5. No, I told you 4.30. You told me it started at 4.30 and I got here at 5.15, which I think is like totally amazing and appropriate for this show. Yeah, I've, I've lied to all my artists and it didn't work for two of them, but it worked for you. <laughs> so I'm on time. Somewhere. Um, yeah, so I, the, the piece that I have upstairs is um, called Pre-Existing Condition, and um, it comes from uh, research that I started doing. I'm, I live here, I'm a Philadelphian, um, on local history. Um, Philadelphia has like a rich medical history in terms of like the first um, hospital being here um, and lots of other things, but anyway, um, basically, from the 50s to the 70s, uh, the University of Pennsylvania ran uh, medical experiments at a prison in Northeast Philadelphia called Holmesburg Prison. Uh, the prison still stands today. It's uh, not used as a prison. It's used as a training center for correctional officers. Um, and I started doing research into this and was mostly looking at the University of Pennsylvania archives and the city archive and um, looking into some scholarship. Um, now is a good time to really thank some of my uh, collaborators. Um, Alan Hornsbaum, who is sort of the person who's written the most and the most publicly about this history is here. Um, so thank you and who also connected me to my collaborator, um, Edward Yusuf Anthony, who is a Holmesburg experimentation survivor and advocate around this history. Um, I, yeah, Yusuf, thank you from, from the bottom of my heart for, um, yeah, letting me into your world. Um, so yeah, so basically I yeah, have been doing a lot of research on this. Um, it felt really critical to me because of how local it is. I'm a Penn alum. I'm also a chronically ill person in the Penn medical system. Um, I have a close relationship with the university. This institution is a part of that institution. And so in some ways this piece was a way for me to um, triangulate a lot of different things, namely, uh, I mean, this might seem ambitious in a kind of, but I think on a micro scale, trying to triangulate um, the prison, the university, the hospital, and um, through my intervention, the archive and the museum. So um, that's, that's basically, that's how I can sort of try to sum it up. But um, the piece, the, the piece in its parts is uh, a conversation with Yusuf and um, some of my research from the archive actually reproduced in a video. And it does all of that, at least for me. And I'm not just saying that because I'm the curator and I'm your friend, but like, <laughs> you did an amazing job. Um, really quick, I'm gonna show Sable Lee Smith's work and just point to this. We're just about out of time, so I wanna keep this moving. Um, Cameron Rollins' work cannot be depicted on screen right now, so please go spend time with the work. I love this piece. I really think you should check it out. Um, and just a shout out to uh, Tusif and James who have done amazing programming around this exhibition. Um, I'm not gonna point to everything, but probably the things I'm like the most hyped on. Um, and one of them is the Kalaloo Conference, which is coming and 
as I mentioned, the homie Amber Rose, is organizing a experimental conversation around temporal entanglement. I really recommend checking it out. It's going to be th two or three days. I always get it wrong. 17th through the 19th, um, three days of conversations. And what Callaloo has produced has just deeply influenced myself and these artists. And I also just got to give a huge shout out to Ian Chukman in the back. Hey guys, uh, Scratch will be forming, uh, performing uh, on the 24th, and I really cannot wait to see that performance. So if you're catching a few things, you've heard me talk, so go see those people. Uh, thank you all so much, and I think, are we releasing people? Is this the, enjoy the shows, uh, and have a good night. Thank you.